I remember thinking like, what right does the European Commission have to tell two American companies they can't merge? And then I kind of forgot about it because I just went back to writing code, right? Um, then years later, when I'm running my own small business, you know, with a couple million in revenue, like, you know, who's going to pay attention to us, right? Um, we're getting acquired by a pretty big conglomerate in the United Kingdom. That should be warning number one, right? United Kingdom, warning number two, right? This is cross-border, right? We did all this global international business, particularly in like the freight and logistics industry, should be warning number three. That's like ridiculously regulated by multiple countries. It's not just saying like, oh, I'm building a, a business that's heavily regulated in the United States. Like this is cross-border trade. So you're usually dealing with two sets of regulators, right? Um, and treaties and, you know, hundreds of years worth of maritime law, right? So I was stupid to just think, oh, this is easy. And so we were ha hauled in front of regulators to explain ourselves. And now luckily the buying company wanted to make it work, but like it also affected our negotiation for price, right? Because now we were contingent and it's like the buying company's kind of, you know, rescuing the deal. I can't turn around and be like, well, you know what, we're worth $10 billion, right? You should buy us. And they'd be like, we almost didn't have a deal. It wasn't for, you know, so it really constricted our way of, of negotiating. So I, I started to, that's when I really started to think about regulatory and things like that. So that was a long answer, but the, the, I guess the sum it up is I just learned a lot in each one of them. <laughs> yeah, that, that's amazing. And I think that's actually a really good uh, segue to, you know, the billion dollar question. What is the biggest risk that's looming for uh, crypto? Uh, and, you know, however you want to uh, approach that, uh, have at it. Sure. I, think, I, mean, I, I, th I think, Stephen, too, it'd be interesting to know just from you, like, how do you think about blockchain and what does it mean for you in the future, right? I think there's a miscon you know, misconsumption around what crypto is. Um, so you being, you know, in technology, it'd be good to, you know, hear that from you. Yeah, I'll, I'll actually start to tackle um, that first, like what came from you, Martin, and then just like layer it on to Aaron. And I, I, I'll probably take a minute to get there, Aaron, but if you feel like I'm not getting there fast enough, feel free to interrupt, right? Because I, I, I need to vent for 10 seconds, which is like, you know, as a VC, it's just so, um, we have almost a joke, right? Like where we get the decks. And I'm like, so like um, the other day, I saw a deck from a partner and a buzzword was in the deck. And I, I sent a Slack message to my partner said, XYZ buzzword, I won't say it. So I don't want to try to have you guess who was pitching us. I go, you know, but like a buzzword like, like blockchain or no code or AI, like one of these buzzwords was said, I said, it was a 40 page deck. I go, it said 85 times, right? You know, I go this buzzword, right? I go, but yet the deck, they really didn't have anything to do with the buzzword, right? Or their value proposition contradicted said buzzword, right? So unfortunately for us, in this Web3 and Web3, I don't even know what Web3 is. It's just like a marketing term that Mark Andreessen made up one day. He woke up and goes, I'm gonna call this Web3 because I like to own, I wanna own this conversation, right? So like, whatever you wanna call it. blockchain is probably a better way of saying it. Like, you know, things are decentralized. So I've, I've I'm, I, you know, in my old startup, and, and, and it's funny because this was like 10 years ago. And now this is 10 years later. So I'm guessing even older. I was the old guy. Right. I was like in my late 30s and all my co-founders and, and fellow executives were all like in their late 20s. Right. So I, I would say think we'd be sitting in a boardroom and they'd be talking about, well, developers are now moving towards X. And I'm like, I have seen this movie before. <laughs> right. You know, developers moving towards X. I go, here's how it's going to end. And, you know, generally speaking, I was right. But it made me a bit of a cynic. Right. Because I and, and it's partly because another piece of my background I left out is my degree in undergraduate, I actually have two degrees in undergraduate. One is in political science, which is less relevant, less so with when we talk about regulatory stuff, but, but history is my other, my other degree. And I, what people think history is just like, you either wanna be a writer or a lawyer or just like a history teacher. Cause those are really the three jobs you can get with a history degree. And, and that's why I, I, I tacked on political science because I realized there's a lot you can do with poli sci. Um, but ultimately, is what, what I've learned to appreciate from the history degree is that you can look at, you, I have an ability from my training as a, hist like a historian, is to look at patterns. And you don't have to just apply it to like, you know, the War of 1812 or this. You can apply it to like, you know, development methodology. You can divide it to technology. So I've used that lens and I look at some of these trends, right? And so on a, from, a, from a large scale, as we've went from mainframe era, super, super centralized, like that's like 
centralized you know textbook definition right then we went to like the web which was decentralized right i'm, I'm glossing over like 30 years of like mini right and now we're kind of with blockchain and we think we're moving into like this this era of decentralization i'll make the argument that it's truly going to be more hybrid than anything else right because um i, I mean i forget like when what was it? when aws went down a couple weeks ago you know, like all these DeFi exchanges went down and they're like oh yeah on the, on the, you know, and their, their PR with all the egg on their face, they're like, oh, you know, on the road to decentralization, we have to have a little bit of centralization. And, you know, I, I think like Moxie over at um, Signal wrote that blog post that, you know, if you haven't read it by now, you're just not cool, right? Um, so I won't, I won't put a link to it or anything, but, you know, in his web three, you know, critique, he basically said, no one wants to run their own server, right? So ultimately, is I feel like we're going to have this hybrid universe, right? So back to now blockchain, where does blockchain fit in? How do I define it? And then ultimately, is, you know, Aaron said, what are the risks of the blockchain? Because it's actually quite relevant, right? Is the first is, you know, so what is blockchain? It's a decentralized ledger, right? So let's be clear about that. The problem is, what does a decentralized ledger lead itself to be? Because there's tons of decentralized database technologies out there, right? The problem is because blockchain is cool, because um, VCs that I think are maybe not as enlightened as me that didn't study history um, are just throwing money at blockchain startups. You get debts with 40, page, 40, 40 slides in them and it says blockchain 85 times. And it wasn't blockchain by the way, um, just to let you know. Um, so companies that have no real reason for using blockchain then start using blockchain. So that's risk number one, right? Um, I actually think that's a bigger risk than the other two or three risks that I'll go through in a minute. But then just thinking about what does blockchain do? So it's a decentralized technology that allows trustless transactions that have an immutable record that's public-ish. I mean, you can have private blockchains or permissions blockchains, of course, right? I mean, the haters will attack me on that stuff. I get it, I get it, I know all that stuff. I'm just being, I'm talking in broad strokes, right? Um, so ultimately then if you have a distributed a distributed um, ledger, or let's just call it what it is, a distributed database, and a bad one at that, but that's a different story, but a distributed database that's immutable, it lends itself, in my view, and which facilitates transactions, between, the trustless transactions between two parties. To me, that limits the scope predominantly, not exclusively, but predominantly to financial transactions, right? So the, so the blockchain solutions that are going to succeed by nature are going to have some, are going to look and smell to be some kind of financial-ish system because where else do you not trust the counterparty in your two-way transaction if not for a financial transaction, right? I mean, if I, you know, I, 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 was, I, was, I, I ran a hackathon on blockchain a few years ago and we had all these, you know, things that would pop up and like, I'm like, well, why does that echo? How are you, why are, these, why are these two people not trust each other? Like, why is that not trustless, right? Like one of them was like hotel operators to upload to Interpol, you know, potential terrorists or whatever are staying at the hotel. But I'm like, okay, if the hotel has a relationship with Interpol, there, there, there are two trusted parties. Interpol could just have a very simple, you know, whether it's centralized or decentralized, right? But like, you don't necessarily need to have like a decentralized blockchain to upload a photo of a terrorist. Right. You could just have a simple centralized server somewhere. Maybe you want to make it a little decentralized so it doesn't, it's not prone to attack. That's what I mean about hybrid systems.